So this article covers the basics in terms of presentation, uh, assessment, and management of excessive daytime sleepiness, which is a very common complaint. I'm Bhanu Kola. I'm a consultant at the Center for Sleep Medicine, the Division of Addiction Psychiatry, and an associate professor in psychiatry and psychology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you for your interest in our paper, Excessive Daytime Sleepiness, a Clinical Review. This article will appear in May 2021 in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. So excessive daytime sleepiness, which can present as uh, people experiencing a lot of sleepiness during the daytime, an irresistible urge to fall asleep or nap, taking too many naps, or a very prolonged nighttime sleep duration, which is unrefreshing, with a lot of sleep inertia upon awakening, so feeling quite uh, slow in the morning and finding it very difficult to get going, is actually fairly common. It can be seen in up to 33% of US adults in most epidemiological studies. It's more common in the younger adults and adolescents where it can be seen in as much as 41%. And when we look at functional limitation from this excessive sleepiness, so you're complaining of feeling excessively sleepy and that's impacting your day-to-day -day life, that can be as high as 15%. So it's a very common condition. The usual causes for excessive sleepiness include, and the most common cause includes not getting enough sleep at night, so insufficient sleep. The other causes are uh, sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea. Sometimes it can be secondary to medication that people are taking and what are called central disorders of hypersomnolence. So the central disorders of hypersomnolence include narcolepsy type 1, type 2, and idiopathic hypersomnia. The assessment for excessive sleepiness usually starts with a very thorough history. So you're trying to make sure uh, people are getting adequate sleep. If there are medications that are uh, being used that can cause sleepiness, you're trying to get some kind of a timeline to associate their sleepiness with those medications. A physical exam looking for uh, signs and symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, which usually involve an elevated BMI, increased neck circumference, or a very crowded oropharynx. And in terms of testing, usually the tests that are involved uh, include getting a sleep study. And in obstructive sleep apnea, depending on your pretest probability, you could do a home sleep apnea test or an in lab study. And for the central disorders of hypersomnolence, this usually involves getting an idea of their sleep pattern for about one to two weeks prior to the sleep study. This is done by either sleep logs or uh, more accurately by using what's called wrist actigraphy, which measures movement and can deduce sleep. So after that, they come in for a sleep study where you're ruling out uh, sleep disordered breathing or other causes for nighttime sleep disruption. And this is usually followed by multiple sleep latency testing. Multiple sleep latency testing usually consists of about four to five nap opportunities, which are provided every two hours. So the patients are uh, asked to lie back and try and fall asleep. You're seeing how quickly do they get to sleep? And you average that out over the four to five naps. You're also looking at whether they're going into REM or dreaming sleep too quickly. So usually within 15 minutes, and that could be an indication for narcolepsy. So in terms of the symptoms for central disorders of hypersomnolence, usually the way we distinguish narcolepsy type one and type two is by the presence of uh, this cardinal symptom of cataplexy. Cataplexy is where patients are experiencing muscle weakness. So uh, that could be the knees buckling, jaw dropping open, sometimes falling, dropping things. When they're experiencing intense emotion, usually humor or mirth, it can also be secondary to being startled or surprised. In narcolepsy, the other symptoms include sleep paralysis. So the patients described waking up, being fully awake, but uh, not being able to move their body. So their mind is awake, body is still asleep. It can be hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations, which include mostly visual hallucinations of so seeing things when patients are just about to go to sleep or just about to wake up. And there is also nighttime sleep disruption along with the excessive daytime sleepiness. Idiopathic hypersomnia is usually uh, going to present with long periods of sleep, 
which are not refreshing, sleep inertia, uh, long naps during the daytime, which are also not refreshing. We can distinguish this based on the testing that I described, but there are also newer tests such as CSF hypocretin levels. So you measure hypocretin in uh, the CSF and when it's less than 110, that usually is an indication that it's narcolepsy. It's much more common in narcolepsy type one rather than type two. Following the assessment, the management usually consists of behavioral strategies and medication. From a behavioral standpoint, the main thing that we are trying to do is ensure that patients get adequate nighttime sleep. So making sure that they're not sleep deprived. If they have obstructive sleep apnea, ensuring that their CPAP use is adequate. Other measures could include things like distraction, even chewing gum, uh, sometimes uh, scheduling naps, and all of those can be helpful. But in almost all cases of central disorders of hyposomnolence, we are looking at medication options as our primary treatment options. And usually we follow a ladder uh, where we use modafinil or armodafinil, so that's provigil, neovigil, and then build from there with the other stimulant medications, so Ritalin, Adderall, Dexedrin, Desoxin. Uh, there are newer medications now, pitolisant and solriamfetol, which are very recently FDA approved, and these have indications in narcolepsy, and we are developing some clinical expertise with this. The studies are reasonably convincing in that they could be effective, so they could be first-line treatment options as well. So thank you for your interest in our paper. Uh, any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us authors, and thanks once again. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.